Hi everyone, my name is Houston Chandler. I'm currently the Director of Science for the Orient Society and a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech in the Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Orient Society and our 11-year history uh, conserving declining reptiles and amphibians. I'll give you a brief history of the organization and talk about our overall mission, and then I'll give you some examples of how we accomplish our conservation mission um, and some of the projects that we've done in recent years. So first, a little bit more about me. Uh, I grew up the son of two wildlife biologists. I spent a lot of time as a kid in the woods catching birds and salamanders and all kinds of creepy crawlies. And this really fostered a love for wildlife from a young age. Um, I transferred that when I went to college into a degree in biology and environmental science at a small liberal arts school, and then transitioned to Virginia Tech uh, for my master's, where I worked with Dr. Carola Haas on flatwood salamander conservation and uh, ephemeral wetlands in the Florida panhandle. I spent about a year doing other research projects at Virginia Tech before ultimately getting a job as a scientist with the Orient Society, where I got to work with all kinds of cool reptiles and amphibians. Uh, in early 2020, I decided it was time to go back to school and am now a PhD candidate, again, working with Carola Haas on flatwood salamander conservation uh, while maintaining a relationship as director of science with the Orient Society. So what is the Orient Society? Well, it started in 2008 when this little girl on the left had an experience with an indigo snake at an outreach event. Um, when she learned that these snakes were threatened and declining in the wild, she actually asked her dad if he could do something to start a conservation project for these snakes. Um, and her dad happened to be Tom Kaplan, who is a very wealthy individual and had the personal uh, assets to actually start a program like this. So he started Project Orian as a family foundation with the sole focus of conserving eastern indigo snakes. Um, and it's gone on from there. In 2015, we began transitioning to a nonprofit. And this really broadened the scope of the organization. It allowed us to work with many other species than just indigo snakes across a wider geographic range. Um, and this is really re relevant when you look at amphibian and reptile diversity in the U.S. Um, the hot spot for both reptile and amphibian diversity is in the south, particularly the southeast. Uh, even more apparent when you look at amphibian diversity, the coastal plain of the southeast is where a majority of that diversity is, along with the Appalachian Mountains, which are a world biodiversity hotspot um, for salamanders. So this region really has an incredible diversity of amphibians and reptiles and many endemic species that are found nowhere else in the world. Unfortunately, the eastern U.S. has also experienced significant human population increases um, over the last, say, 300 years. And along with these population increases have come significant habitat alterations. Um, much of the forests in the eastern United States have been cut at least once, if not totally changed to either urban or farming or some other land use. So there are significant conservation challenges uh, for these animals in this region, and it really uh, makes it clear that there's a need for this kind of conservation work for, a, uh, for groups of animals that don't often receive this kind of conservation attention. So the Orient Society's mission is to conserve critical ecosystems for reptiles and amphibians using science, applied conservation, and education. And this uh, mission written out like this is important for a couple reasons. 
First, it focuses on critical ecosystems. So you're performing conservation at the ecosystem level, which not only protects uh, these rare reptiles and amphibians, but also provides habitat for many other species of birds, uh, plants, insects. All those species all depend on the same types of ecosystems. Um, and it also uses science to inform on the ground conservation. So we look at things, uh, answer important questions that allow us to make better conservation decisions um, for these rare species. This is kind of a daunting task when you look at it. Uh, like I already showed, there's high diversity in these reason, regions. There's a lot of um, different types of habitats and different needs for various species. So how do you approach conservation at such wide um, spatial scales that can benefit the most species? And really to do this, we've broken our conservation initiatives down by region. So we have a Longley Savannas initiative in the Southeast, an Appalachian Highlands initiative um, in the mountains, and then our newest initiative is the Great Northern Forest Initiative um, in the Northeast. And these, these initiatives typically focus on either sentinel landscapes or key focal species. So for example, the Great Northern Forest Initiative, like I said, is our newest initiative. And you may think, well, why is there a conservation initiative for reptiles and amphibians in the Northeast? It's cold, the diversity is not as high. Um, that's actually true, but the reptiles and amphibians that are there are uh, actually pretty special. And they include some of these freshwater turtles, like the wood turtle and the Blanding's turtle on the right here, uh, that don't live anywhere else. These uh, species are mostly restricted to the northeastern U.S. and Canada. And so they, um, being freshwater turtles, have also declined precipitously in many places in recent years. And so they need a lot of conservation work. And so these charismatic species um, allow us to have conservation programs in the northeast where there's really not a lot of reptile and amphibian conservation. And then in the Appalachian Highlands, uh, this initiative mostly focuses on timber rattlesnakes and eastern hellbenders. Uh, so for example, we go out every year and we monitor gestation sites for timber rattlesnakes uh, to see how many babies are producing and how many uh, gravid females show up each year. And then the initiative that I'm most familiar with that I worked in is the Longley Savannas Initiative. And this focuses on the Longley Pine ecosystem and the many species uh, that call this ecosystem home. This is uh, particularly relevant because Longley Pines are one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world and exist at uh, less than 3% of their historic range. Uh, so a lot of conservation work is needed and has gone on with these species. Uh, in this in this ecosystem. And so like I said earlier, the conservation work gets done through research, uh, applied conservation and education. And so I'm going to go through and give you some examples uh, of each of these and what they look like in reality. Uh, but when you think about it, uh, to better conserve these species, we have to know where the species are located, are populations declining, if they are declining, why are they declining, and then ultimately will this species still be here in 100, 200, 300 years, and if not, is there something that we can do about it? Uh, can we improve the habitat? Can we make the public more aware of these species uh, to help alleviate some of these stressors, stressors on populations? Um, and so that's kind of the overview of how we approach conservation. And so I'll give you an example of some of one of the research projects that I helped do in the last couple of years. Uh, these are spotted turtles. They are the second smallest turtle in North America. Cute little guys with uh, black shells and uh, yellow spots. And they live in shallow freshwater wetlands up and down the East Coast. Um, all the way from Florida up into Canada. It's a pretty incredible species. And we wanted to know really what these turtles at the southern end of their distribution, so that's in Florida and Georgia, how they were reproducing and how much reproductive effort they were putting in each year. Um, nobody had looked at this before, and this is one of the key aspects of understanding how populations fluctuate through time. So what we did is we attached radio transmitters, you can see one right here, uh, to female turtles in the spring. 
and then we followed them around until we thought they were gravid. We took them in, got them x-rayed so that we could count eggs. So this female has four eggs in her, and that was actually the biggest clutch that we recorded during the study. Um, and then when we thought they were about to lay these eggs, we attached thread spools to them, mostly using duct tape. So you tie one end off in the environment, and then the female travels through the environment, and the thread trails behind her, and then you can go back the next day and follow her movements. And hopefully the thread will get stuck in the nest just like this, and then you can go and find where the nest is. Uh, it works sometimes, doesn't work all the time, but we were pretty successful at finding nests. Sometimes, like here, they didn't even cover their nest, so it was very easy to find. Um, so we set out to do this to really understand what they were doing. And we found that in the southern populations, they actually lay multiple clutches pretty frequently. Um, about 33% of the turtles that we followed laid three clutches in a single breeding season, which is about two and a half months. So that they're producing eggs rapidly. Um, and they're doing this laying multiple clutches to make up for their small, small body size. So they have only uh, usually only two to three eggs, sometimes only one egg um, per clutch. So they're laying multiple clutches to make up um, for the small body size, although by the time you get to a third clutch, they were actually significantly smaller than the first two clutches. So there may be some cost uh, to doing this too. And then if you look at nest survival, about 50% of the nests that we were able to locate actually hatched. And this is actually pretty good for a freshwater turtle species. Uh, predation rates in some populations of freshwater turtles uh, can exceed 80 or 90%, and this can have significant uh, costs uh, on the population over time. So we are pretty happy to only see 50% uh, mortality in nests. And we actually plan to do this study again this spring, and that'll give us a pretty good data set about the reproductive activity in these turtles. So that's an example of some of the research that we do, but what about land management? Uh, land management is actually truly arguably the more important part because creating habitat and maintaining habitat um, is important for species conservation. If the habitat is not there, the species will not be there. In the Longleaf Savannas Initiative, this really means creating a, an ecosystem from scratch oftentimes. Um, like I said, Longleaf Pine has been dramatically reduced and so you have to go in and essentially replant all these plants in areas um, where they aren't anymore. So that means planting trees and then collecting uh, grass seed and other types of uh, vegetation on the forest floor. So we collect all the seed from somewhere like this. It looks like this. You dry it out and then you go and plant it um, in an area like this where it isn't anymore. So you're really starting at square one to uh, plant trees, then plant grasses, and then once you have those plants or in areas where those plants still are, you can go back and uh, start beginning to apply prescribed fire to the landscape. Longleaf pines are a fire adapted ecosystem and need regular wildfires um, to sustain themselves and to maintain their characteristic vegetation uh, structure. So it's really a large scale effort to both create new habitat and maintain the habitat that is already there um, for these rare and endangered species. And part of this um, focuses on the Orient Indigo Snake Preserve. So this is about a 2,500 acre property located in South Georgia that was originally purchased just for Eastern Indigo Snake Conservation, but it also has uh, things like gopher tortoises and some rare upland plants, um, and also some other uh, amphibians and things native to the region like tiger salamanders. And so this type of property, type of conservation, uh, land that can be well managed with regular prescribed fire is critical to maintaining these species um, over the long term. And this is a long term investment. Um, prescribed fire is, or natural wildfire, is never going to return to the southeast on a large scale. And so it's up to us to manage this habitat appropriately. And then finally, education and outreach. Um, reptiles and amphibians don't always have the best uh, view from the public perspective. Many people are scared of snakes. Many people think snakes are out to get them. Um, many people are unaware of the diversity of reptiles and amphibians that you can see 
both in your backyard and in the region. And so getting people um, hands-on experience with these animals, talking to them about them, letting them touch a rattlesnake while it's restrained if they've never done that um, can go a long way to uh, fostering positive attitudes toward reptiles and amphibians. Um, and I'll give you an example of what that looks like. So we hear stories all the time about giant snakes, snakes that are so big that it's impossible um, that that could even exist in the wild. And this often has to do with rattlesnakes because people are scared of rattlesnakes. So we hear stories about 10, 12 foot rattlesnakes that people have seen in the woods. In reality, rattlesnakes don't get that big. Um, the snake in this video is Edgar. He is an albino eastern diamondback rattlesnake, and he is the largest eastern diamondback ever measured. Um, he is just over seven feet. So when you're talking about a 10-foot rattlesnake, you're talking about a snake that's three feet longer than the largest one ever measured. Um, and so we like to share these kinds of things with people to try to... Um, make them understand how big these animals actually are, what their behaviors actually are, uh, so that they'll have a better appreciation for native wildlife. And one of the things that we also do is we like to take people out in the field, so not just bringing animals to them, but taking them out into the woods to get them hands-on experience with uh, wild snakes or other uh, reptiles and amphibians. And so we host both an Indigo Days event and a Places You Never Herped event each year. And that lets Orient Society members um, come out with us, do surveys, find some of these rare animals, um, and see the type of work that we do on a daily basis. So speaking of work that we do on a daily basis, what's it like to work for a nonprofit? Uh, well, I would have a hard time coming up with a better job. Uh, we spend a lot of time outside working with species that are very cool, that are hard to find, that a lot of people don't get to see. Uh, we've caught, over the last several years, we've worked with alligator snapping turtles. We worked with rattlesnakes, with indigo snakes, with spotted turtles. Uh, we set the woods on fire, all kinds of stuff that a lot of people uh, would have a great time doing. And it's very rewarding work. You can see the fruits of your labor, uh, both from increasing our knowledge about these animals and from improving habitat quality. Um, so from that perspective, it's great. There are challenges. It's a small organization uh, that we all do a lot of work to make it go. Um, it can be long hours sometimes. And of course, funding is always a challenge for a nonprofit, particularly working with reptiles and amphibians. Uh, but it is a very rewarding job. Um, and we often have seasonal technician positions and things like that. So you can look at our website and we'll post job opportunities uh, when we have them. And then the other good part about working for Orient is that we get to work with a diverse group of partners and other organizations. On the right here, catching snapping turtles with Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation, and on the left, filming a TV segment for uh, the Coastal Kingdom program. And so working with these great groups of people really enhances the conservation mission and lets us uh, really benefit these animals as much as possible. So I'll end with this. Um, one of the things that makes wherever you live special is the native wildlife that lives there. Uh, in the southeastern U.S., that is commonly reptiles and amphibians. In the Appalachian Mountains, it's salamanders. Um, these species live nowhere else in the world. In many cases, they are what make the landscape special. And it is really up to us to make sure that the natural heritage of these regions doesn't disappear and that it is there for our kids and grandkids um, to see when they grow up. And so it really is up to us um, as individuals and as larger groups doing conservation missions um, to promote and protect these animals and ensure that they have a future. And with that, I'll leave you with some pictures of some of the cool native reptiles and amphibians from the Southeast. Um, if you would like to contact me and know more, please do. Always happy to talk about reptiles and amphibians or the Orient Society um, or really anything else conservation uh, related. So thanks for listening. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed it.